morning and a very warm welcome to Strathblane Parish Church of Scotland. Good to have you with us for our Sunday service today. I'm going to begin by reading in Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. May the Lord bless to us this reading from his word. Shall we draw near to God in prayer? Shall we all unite our hearts in a word of prayer together? Loving Heavenly Father, we do bless you for this day, your day of rest, your day of peace, this day that reminds us of all that uh, God has done for us and giving us life and uh, giving us second life in Jesus Christ. We pray that you will bless us now with the hope of the gospel, the hope of the cross, the hope that uh, God has overcome all our failings, all our sin, all the darkness uh, of this world. Be with us as we meditate upon your word and all that we ask. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The soldiers led Jesus away to be flogged. He was stripped of his clothes, tied to a post, and beaten by several soldiers with a whip that was usually made of leather strips fitted with pieces of bone and lead. After the scourging, the soldiers put a robe on Jesus. It was probably an old garment that had been discarded by one of the soldiers. Matthew says the robe was scarlet, but Mark and John call it purple, suggesting that it was badly faded. It was probably the nearest thing to the royal colour of purple the soldiers could find. Their aim was to make a complete mockery of the claim that Jesus made, or others made, concerning Jesus that he was king. What kind of king was he? Of course, every, every king needs a crown, so the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on Jesus' head. These thorns could have been uh, up to several inches uh, in length. They said, Hail, King of the Jews, in jeering tones. In all of this, Jesus remained silent. He was guilty of nothing, yet he said no words, spoke no defense. We read in Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers, shearers is dumb, silent, so he did not open his mouth or say a word. Others had declared his innocent innocence, but Jesus never defended himself. Judas cried out, I have betrayed innocent blood. Pilate, an Pilate announced, I find no fault in him. The thief on the cross beside Jesus said, this man has done nothing wrong. The centurion exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Yet Jesus never said a word. He was silent. Jesus was then led away to be crucified, but Jesus was in no condition to carry the heavy weight of the cross. The soldiers grew impatient with Jesus' slow pace, and they grabbed a man named Simon along the way, making him carry Jesus' cross. Jesus' exhaustion is completely understandable. The previous day he had been so cruelly treated uh, the day had been so harsh and so difficult that even his disciples when, were unable to stay awake when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But that was only the beginning of extreme agony for Jesus. He was arrested, beaten repeatedly, held without sleep uh, for uh, all of that night, beaten some more then in the morning. It's no wonder he was too weak to carry his cross. We need to remember that the cross came as no surprise to Jesus. It was not something unexpected. Only a few days earlier, he had told his disciples, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Any other person knowing what Jesus knew would have gone nowhere near Jerusalem on that day. But the love of Jesus carried him there. He said, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one can take my life from me. I lay it down voluntarily. Mark tells us that they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, using a Greek expression for brought that suggests he was actually born along to that place, probably walking with much difficulty, needing constant support from the soldiers as he made his way to the place of execution and crucifixion. We view the cross in a very different way from the people of the first century. Today we adorn our cemeteries and our churches with crosses, and some people even wear them around their neck. But in ancient times, crucifixion was synonymous with horror and shame. It was a death inflicted on slaves, bandits, prisoners of war, and revolutionaries. In our reading today, we see what the Apostle Paul has to say about the cross. We read in Colossians 2 verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and uh, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. In other words, not cut off, not cut away from you, not dealt with. God made you alive with Christ. What Paul wants us to know is that firstly, the cross was once considered an instrument of death and humiliation, but now we are to see it as a completely different thing. We're to see it as a symbol of life. Jesus died a cruel death, humiliating for him, and he did so that we might have eternal life. Jesus died, but death could not hold him. He rose again victorious over death, and he promises eternal life to all who believe him, in him and on him. The cross was a symbol of humiliation. It is now a symbol of eternal life, life forevermore. And secondly, the cross was once an instrument of shame, but now it is a symbol of unimaginable, incomprehensible, astonishing forgiveness. We read there the written code. This refers to a list of our sins. We are asked to imagine a law court clerk writing down all the hurtful things we've said, the shameful deeds we've done, the list of our sins stood opposed to us, against us, condemned us. In other words, they were able to keep us from ever knowing God, or entering into his presence, or knowing eternal life with God. But God cancelled the list. The words here means uh, cleansed, cleaned, or wiped away. Like a teacher wipes a blackboard, they are obliterated forever because of God's grace, his mercy, and his love, and his kindness. Not a trace, this is the emphasis, not a trace of that list remains to be held against us. You are forgiven. Christ died to forgive, to pardon all our sins, wiped away, completely forgotten. No one can ever hold them against us again. How unlike our forgiving other people this is, we still remember we still continue to hold on to grudges and grievances. We remember the acts done against us and to us. But God is not like that. How did Jesus wipe away our sins, take them away forever? Paul says God took it away by nailing it to the cross. The IOU could not simply be torn up and thrown away. The penalty for non-payment was death. He has forgiven you all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the written evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our head. And he has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. And the point is that Jesus died. He bore the penalty for all our sins. He took the nails. Jesus suffered and died in a room in our place. And the moment he died, God wiped away all our sins for those who believe in Jesus Christ. 
Thirdly, Paul says the cross was once a sign of helplessness, but now it's a sign of incomparable hope. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Christ made a public spectacle of his enemies, all who are not like him, and the opposite of all that he is and all that God is. Each one of them has been humbled and humiliated and defeated Christ as victor, and he makes a spectacle of them. He made a public display of all the evil forces of the universe. The images of a conquering hero or warrior leading a procession of his vanquished foes. Putting them on display, showing them off as defeated. To all the sin and darkness, he said, you're defeated. Darkness, you're defeated. Sin, you're defeated. Death, you're defeated. Coronavirus, illness, you don't have the last word in my life today. Jesus will have the last word, because the whole world is in his hands. He owns it all. He is king of all. He has defeated every darkness and every foe, and he has the last word in all that happens to us. All, everything fell at the victor's feet. The cross meets our deepest needs. It offers us life with hope, meaning forgiveness, and victory over every destructive force. I read about a missionary in China. One day he was walking with a Chinese friend in a city in China. They came across three men sitting in the town square with police guards watching over them. Each man had a, a board around his neck bearing Chinese writing. The missionary asked his friend what was written on the boards. His friend answered, one says that he is a thief, one is a drug addict, one was charged and is charged with violent crimes. Their sins, in other words, paraded for all the world to see. Well, says Paul, we were all like that. Jesus entered into the marketplace where we were condemned, and he wiped all our sins away with his own hand, with his own life with his own body broken, his blood shed. It cost us nothing to have this forgiveness. It cost Jesus everything. All we need to do is believe upon him. What great love Jesus has for each one of us, that he would go to the cross, that he would make his way to the cross in the way that he did, in the manner in which he did, willingly, not running away from the cross, but going towards it and preparing himself to take all of our sins and to make them his own, as if they were his very own. For love of you and for love of me, he bled and he died. This manner of love, this kind of love, makes a demand upon us. It demands that we love him in return and follow him and obey him and do all that Jesus would have us to do. It's the least we can do for the one who has done all for us. Paul says the cross was once an instrument of death, but now it's a symbol of life. The cross was once an instrument of shame, but now it is a symbol of unimaginable forgiveness. The cross was once an instrument of helplessness, but now it is an instrument, a symbol of hope. Hope of darkness overcome of sins forgiven, and of eternal life. Was it Martin Luther who said, hope in every circumstance, because every dark circumstance and whatever you're going through is in the Lord's hand and in God's hand. You have hope today, whatever you are going through, because Jesus rules and reigns, and he is a God of love and a, a Savior who loves us. Always hope in every circumstance. May the Lord bless to us these thoughts in his word. Amen. Shall we draw near to God in prayer? Shall we all pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we can scarcely take it in that Jesus died for our sins. 
He has wiped away every judgment against us, every failing obliterated. Not content with that, Jesus defeated evil and darkness and hopelessness and even conquered death itself. Remind us of these truths today. We need to be reminded often because we so easily forget. Remind the sick there is always hope of healing. Remind the sinner there is always forgiveness with Christ. Remind the bereaved there is eternal life for all who hope and believe in Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer, spoken and unspoken, and all that we ask. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you in the week ahead, and I look forward to seeing you again next week for our Sunday service.